on this Thursday night. I was not aware of that until until today. Former Tory MP Tony Clement makes public a second incident. The ad issue panel looks at the political challenges involved. My firstborn son. Agonizing reactions from families and witnesses after another mass killing in the United States. What we know about the man who pulled the trigger. People are all thinking the same thing, like right? stocking up. And devastating fires ripped through a calorie. What it means for supplies of food and medicine. This is the National. There is more to the Tony Clement sexting scandal than he originally made public, and things could be going from bad to worse for the former Conservative veteran. Forced out of the party caucus, removed from a key National Security Committee, he now faces more tough questions about another incident. Catherine Cullen has the latest. I don't think too many people need to be told uh, that uh, it's inappropriate to send uh, explicit photos and videos to people you never met. Yet that's precisely what Tony Clement did. You know, I understand and utilize the power of social media every day. Once thought of as a politician with a keen grasp of online communication, he revealed today that for months someone has been trying to expose his indiscretions. In a letter, Clement says, one inappropriate exchange led to a woman being offered money by an anonymous social media account in exchange for the disclosure of intimate and personal information. I immediately reported this personal matter to the OPP last summer. That's in addition to the extortion attempt Clement went public about this week. I was not aware of that until until today. Uh, again, as I mentioned, when Tony and I spoke about what happened uh, more recently, uh, it was presented to me as a uh, as an isolated uh, uh, event. That there were two attempts takes on added significance because Clement was a member of Parliament's National Security and Intelligence Committee, meeting in secret and accessing sensitive information. You have second thoughts about the Security Committee? It leads to uncomfortable questions about whether that had anything to do with Clement being targeted and whether officials knew what was going on. There are rules for committee members. They state, a member must without delay provide the clerk of the Privy Council with a report of any change in their personal circumstances that may affect their security clearance. A government source says officials were only notified of Clement's situation last week. And Catherine joins us now. Some people wondering about the timing of these disclosures by Tony Clement. That's right, Ian. The Toronto Star was actually about to report some of the details of these incidents, and it seems that they reached out to Tony Clement for comment first. Instead, he decided to give his own version of events via this letter uh, explaining his take on things and also expressing a lot of remorse for all of this. And in your item, you touched on uh, the security concerns here. Tell us more about that. We don't know who the person or persons behind this were, and certainly Tony Clement has suggested that this was about financial extortion, that somebody was trying to make some money off of him. But there are a lot of details that are not clear around all of this right now, and the fact that he was targeted on two separate occasions suggests that this was not entirely random, and that certainly heightens those security concerns. Thanks, Catherine. You're welcome. And we'll have more on the story a little later in the program. At Issue is here to look at how political parties and their leaders should respond to these types of situations. Now to a new development in a story we broke earlier this year. For the first time, someone from the inner circle of the band, Headley, is speaking out about the sexual misconduct allegations against the group's lead singer. Jacob Hogard faces charges of sexual assault causing bodily harm and sexual interference. The alleged victims, a woman and girl under the age of 16. 44-year-old Chris Crippen was a drummer with Headley for 11 years. He stopped performing with the band in 2016, the same year of the alleged crimes. Crippen says he wants to support the women who came forward only to face an online backlash. And he says he's also speaking to police. The CBC's Judy Trin has worked this story for months and has tonight's exclusive. For a decade, Chris Crippen stood behind Jacob Hogard, but now Headley's former drummer is stepping forward, speaking for the first time about the lead singer. Female fans would walk up and he would say, uh, hey you f***ing how you doing? 
Crippen was officially fired by the band in March 2017 after their relationship deteriorated. But before the split, Crippen says he witnessed plenty of inappropriate behavior by Headley's frontman. Yeah, he's just this brute, hard guy to be around, you know. I was surprised at the severity of what we're dealing with now, of the allegations. Jacob Hogard is now charged with sexually assaulting two women and causing them bodily harm. One victim was under the age of 16 when she was allegedly attacked. The other says she was raped by Hogard in the fall of 2016. Held me down and forced me to have anal sex with him. Hogard says he never engaged in non-consensual sex and is defending against the criminal charges. Crippen says Hogard would often share unwanted lewd images of himself and of the women he had been with. He would also send emails containing racist and homophobic images to producers, musicians and managers. Its behavior Crippen considered harassment. After sexual misconduct allegations surfaced, Watchdog management dropped the band. In a new statement, the president of Watchdog says the company has learned from its mistakes. The band was challenging to work with. At the time, we chalked it up to immaturity, attention-seeking and shock value. I regret not having taken stronger action at the time. After 10 years uh, at this level, uh, you're a pretty well-known face and you have um, people think of you differently for sure. I think he took advantage of that. Living the rock star life, it has nothing to do with violence or degradation. Crippen is attempting to restart his music career, stalled, he says, because of his connection to Hogard. It's had a backlash in a lot of, a, a lot of people's lives. In my own, it's been difficult to move on. In a statement, Hogard, along with the current members of Headley, called Crippen disgruntled and bitter. They accused the drummer of performing a hatchet job on Hogard, while the singer's criminal charges wind their way through the courts. Judy Trin, CBC News, Ottawa. Here's what else we're working on tonight on The National. The mayor of Iqaluit warns people not to panic after a fire destroys one of just two major retailers with a winter supply of groceries and merchandise. Police are still searching for the reasons why a man walked into a California bar and started shooting. We'll have stories from some of the survivors. But first, workers at Bombardier received some devastating news today. The Montreal aerospace and transportation giant is swimming in debt, and officials say it needs what they call streamlining. So Bombardier is selling off its Dash 8 turboprop program, also known as the Q series, as well as its business aircraft and flight training divisions. And you might remember that earlier this year, Bombardier already sold its money-losing C series jet to Europe's Airbus. 5,000 jobs will be affected over the next year and a half, half of those in Quebec. So that's where we want to take you now, the place where workers are once again wondering what the future might hold. Jayla Bernstein spoke to them. Uh, I don't have a plan B, you know. I've been here all my life. That's what I do for a living. The news came as a surprise to these Montreal employees. Would you like to talk to us about the cuts today? Most avoided questions okay. from the media, and those who did speak said they're being kept in the dark. No internal memos, no explanations beyond what they see in the news. Cuts at the aerospace giant have become routine for longtime employees. Oh my God, I cannot count them anymore. <laughs> it's sad. Personally, I have never been laid off. But it's not the story for the same story for everybody. Top Brass says it was a tough decision, but a necessary one to make the company leaner and more profitable. We're in the midst of a turnaround plan, five years turnaround plan. And part of that, we have to transform the way we are doing things. We have to become more productive. 5,000 job cuts doesn't mean all those workers will be out of a job. Some might find other positions within the company. Still, until Bombardier explains who will be affected and when exactly, workers are living in uncertainty. None of them know if they're affected or not. So now you've got this, this like feeling inside the plants and all that of, of worry. Everybody wondering, you know, uh, they're talking about doing it over the next period of the next 18 months. People are wondering, is it going to be before Christmas? Am I going to be affected? It's a dark day in there. It's a dark day in there. A lot of people are, uh, uh, can't believe uh, the Dash 8 that's been built here since early 80s is, is going to be leaving. Both provincial and federal governments are offering their reassurances. Mr. Speaker, our hearts go out to the workers, their families, and the community's impact by this morning's announcement. Chances are good this isn't the last time we'll hear about job cuts at Bombardier. 
Company executives say that there's still more need for restructuring if they want to remain competitive in the industry, though they won't go into details about what that actually means for their employees down the road. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Montreal. And today's news has implications beyond just Quebec and Ontario. That's because for decades, both the provincial and federal governments have poured in billions of taxpayer dollars to prop the company up. Ottawa gave more than $300 million in interest-free loans to the company last year. And the year before that, Bombardier got the last installment of a $1.3 billion investment from Quebec. Okay, let's flip over to another story, a dramatic one that unfolded in Canada's north. It took most of the day for firefighters to bring a massive fire under control in a Iqaluit. And then authorities had some public panic to put out. The city's biggest retailer, one of just two major grocery stores in the city, went up in flames. And in a place where food prices are already sky high, a single fire can cause a whole lot of damage. Jordan Kunik takes us there. The fire started 2 in the morning, by far the biggest of five fires that crews were called to last night. In the North Mark was Ekaluit's biggest general store, setting everything from fresh produce to furniture, all of it flown in. All efforts are going to be made to ensure that we have sufficient food uh, for everyone. The city says there will be enough, but even so, residents of Ekaluit still rush to try to buy supplies at the other main store. Everybody's panicking. It looks like it's a bit of a war zone here, right? Because everybody knows the, the food supply up here is limited to begin with. Losing North Mart is devastating to the community. For me, I was very upset that the store caught on fire, said Lou Philip. This is a place where everybody goes. It's a big part of North Mart that we're going to lose. And uh, a lot of skidoos that are going to be up in flames too. It's not just food and supplies. The North Mart also had one of only two pharmacies here. City officials and retailers met this afternoon to come up with an emergency plan. The North Mart says it is working with its only competitor, Arctic Ventures, to keep the shelves full for the community. The fire at the North Mart burned all day long, and the city officials appealed for people to conserve water. Nearby homes and senior facility also had to be evacuated. No one was injured here or in any of the fires that are under investigation. Officials won't say if they suspect arson. Jordan Kunni, CBC News, Ekalui. The city of Thousand Oaks, California, in greater Los Angeles, is the latest community in the United States to try to cope with a mass shooting. This one happened late last night at a crowded bar popular with college students. An evening of dancing and birthday celebrations shattered by gunfire. The shooter was a Marine Corps veteran. He murdered 12 people before turning the gun on himself. Why remains a mystery. The CBC's Kim Brunhuber is in Thousand Oaks tonight. Before the bullets flew, before the stampede to escape, Holden Hara remembers it all. The shooter strolling into the borderline bar and grill, reaching into his pockets as if to pay the cover charge. Saw the man pull out his gun and start shooting. I saw the flash of the gun. Then chaos. Hara and some of his friends managed to crawl out a back door. I'm very lucky to be on my feet and, you know, for the people that didn't make it out tonight, it sucks because they didn't deserve it. Innocent lives were taken tonight. Jason Kaufman tracked his son Cody's cell phone to the bar, but the signal wasn't moving. Later at the hospital, he learned why. My firstborn son. Only him and I know how much I love, how much I miss. Oh, God, this is so hard. Oh, son, I love you so much. This morning, a motorcade for a police officer killed as he rushed in to confront the gunman. As I told his wife, he died a hero because he went he, he went in to save lives, to save other people. A sign of just how often these horrors are happening in America these days. For some survivors, this wasn't their first mass shooting. Unfortunately, it's the second time in about a year and a month that this has happened. Uh, I was at the Las Vegas. About 91 mass shooting. 
which is why Grace Fisher drove down to the scene with her well-worn sign. Fisher pulls it out to lobby for gun control after every mass shooting. This one, so close to home. That's why I came out here today. Anytime this happens, we have to stand up and we have to say, this is not okay. Something needs to change immediately. Hara's mom is calling. She wants him home. On his hand, you can see an X stamped by the bouncer to show he's underage. Hara says he won't wash it off, a tribute to his dead friends. He knows the mark will fade, but the horrific memories of last night will be with him, he says, always. Kim Bruggeber, CBC News, Thousand Oaks, California. We do know the gunman, Ian David Long, was a military veteran, possibly suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, and he had had contact with local police. But as for a motive, that is still unclear. It would be premature for me to speculate on the motivation, but I can assure you that we will follow all the leads that are developed through witness interviews, uh, evidence recovery, um, the forensic evidence, um, any digital media that we recover, and uh, we will be sure to uh, paint a picture of the state of mind of the subject and uh, do our best to identify a motivation. Investigators hope for some insight from Long's house where the 28-year-old lived with his mother. But here's a little more on his military background. Records show Long was an active duty Marine between 2008 to 2013. He was deployed to Afghanistan in 2010 and served as a machine gunner. Long was in action in Helmand province during one of the most violent periods of the Afghan conflict. He left the Marines in 2013 with the rank of corporal. One friend described him as funny but with a tendency to get dark at times. Neighbors have said his mother was increasingly worried about his mental state. We have reported on many mass shootings in the United States. And as Kim said, one of last night's survivors has been through this before. A grim coincidence that, that warrants another look. It's the second time in about a year and a month that this has happened. Uh, I was at the Las Vegas Route 91 mass shooting, uh, as well as probably 50 or 60 others who are in the building at the same time as me tonight. And so that young man had planned to hold a memorial for the Vegas massacre at the Borderline Bar and Grill. This was the fourth mass shooting in the United States this year in which at least 10 people died. And still ahead tonight on The National, the U.S. midterm elections on Tuesday saw the Democrats take control of the House. But what does that mean for Canada and more specifically our new trade deal? Rosie and the Ad Issue panel will break it all down for us. Transport Canada made airlines responsible for their own safety protocols when they brought in a self-reporting system. But CBC News has documents that show the system can fail. And it turns out that Canada Choice label on your apple juice may not mean what you think it means. I think there would be a lot of people feeling really deceived if they knew the whole story. But right now, you can't get the whole story. You look at that product, how do you know where it's from? What needs to change is, uh, is you need to know where your juice is coming from. Last year, Canadian farmers produced more than 345,000 tons of apples. That's more than 40% of all fruit produced in this country. And so when you buy juice and see shiny red Macintoshes or words like Canada Choice on the container, you might think it's being made with Canadian apples. But as Charles Agro shows us in this week's Marketplace Investigation, you need to look beyond the product label. If they're not quite ready, it's hard. Brett Schuyler sure knows how to pick them. In a given year, he'll harvest four and a half million kilograms of apples, but next to none of it will wind up for sale in cans, cartons, or juice boxes. I think there would be a lot of people feeling really deceived if they knew the whole story. But right now, you can't get the whole story. You look at that product, how do you know where it's from? Less and less apple juice is being made with Canadian apples, despite the subtle hints, phrases and logos suggesting otherwise. These are Macintosh. But are these apples for juice or are these... Those all fresh apples, so like actually these, we picked these last week, there'd be less than 5% uh, juice. And the reason is simple. Cheap foreign concentrate is flooding the Canadian market. China is the number one supplier of apple juice concentrate to Canada. Schuyler believes labels need to change so Canadian consumers can be sure about what they're drinking. We don't have a requirement to put where things are from, then why, why is somebody going to do that? Right. 
Canada. Canadian label laws do not require companies making that juice to say where the apples that went into making it came from. I'm just wondering if you can tell me where the apples came from that made this juice. So you want the country of origin? I can certainly help you with that. To find out where the apples are coming from in some of Canada's most popular juices, Marketplace called up the customer service numbers listed on the labels. Hey, thank you so much for her. Most of the ingredients are from China. Customer service agents told Marketplace juices were produced with apple concentrate from several countries, including China, Poland, Argentina, Chile, New Zealand, the U.S., and with some apples from Canada. This is the American one. Take a look at its labeling. Canadians don't have to look far for another way. Contains apple juice concentrate from the USA, Argentina, Chile, China and Turkey. In the U.S., companies are required to include country of origin information on their juices. When pressed about why it won't require the same of Canadian manufacturers, this country's label police, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, doesn't think it's a priority for all consumers. From a regulatory perspective, we are making the balance between being ultra-prescriptive and being able to give flexibility to both the consumers, because not all consumers want that level okay. of detail, and some do. Alain Dimitri is the executive director of the CFIA. She believes consumers have a role to play too. We need to learn how to actually collectively read the labels to make sure that we are not inferring certain things that are not intended on the label. Canadian food label laws are undergoing a massive review, but no changes are planned for apple juice. Cheers. It's why Skylar's focus will remain on getting the most from his farm and his fresh apples for eating, not drinking. Charles Siagro, CBC News, Toronto. Still to come tonight on The National, Tony Clement says he went to the police not once but twice because of an inappropriate exchange. At issue is here to talk about the ongoing scandal and how Andrew Scheer and the Conservative Party have reacted. Plus, CBC News has documents that show Canada's air safety system doesn't always work. There are insufficient inspectors to conduct hands-on investigations. Safety costs money. Taking Tony at his word that this is uh, that this is uh, the, the first time that this has happened, I took him at his word that uh, this was an isolated incident. Incident. Since then, there have been numerous reports of, of other incidents, uh, allegations. This was a, a shock to me when when uh, when I was made aware of the situation, um, and uh, there's no indication that this uh, sort of thing was happening. That was Andrew Scheer before, then an hour later after a caucus meeting yesterday and then again today. The opposition leader has changed his response and ultimately he ousted Tony Clement from the Conservative caucus. So how does a party and its leader handle this kind of thing politically? At Issue is here to dig into that and more. Andrew Coyne is here in Toronto tonight. Althea Raj is in Ottawa and Paul Wells is also in Ottawa. Good to see everybody. Chantal is off this week. Uh, Andrew, let's start with you. Um, I, I mean, we don't have to get into the nitty gritty of, of the case and because there's more details uh, emerging. Um, but the fact that Andrew Scheer uh, first allowed Tony Clement to just remove himself from committees, got more information and then asked him to leave from caucus. What do you make of his response sort of overall? Well, I guess one thing we learned from a lot of these cases is it's unusual if it's just one time. Uh, so he may have been a bit credulous or whatever other word you want to use in taking him at his word that first time. Mm. The general with, rule with these things, I guess, is you want to get out in front of it. You want to be seen to be acting decisively. You don't want to be seen to be covering anything up or being too soft in it. Uh, in this case, there wasn't, I think, really questions of, of uh, due process involved. It was admitted that he'd been involved in what he'd been involved in. Um, so, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a messy situation for everybody. I, I think they were scrambling to try and deal with it as best they could, and perhaps they were a little slow behind the ball. Um, Althea, what, what do you think of the way Andrew Scheer handled it and sort of responded to it over the past couple of days now? Uh, I'm of two minds. If you take the leader at his word, he acted decisively faced with the allegations that he thought he was facing, basically that Mr. Clement was being uh, allegedly extorted by a foreign actor who sought to take advantage of his infidelities and then 
dumped him as justice critic and pulled him from the National Security Committee. Um, but then if you pair that with what we're hearing now from people like Rachel Curran, uh, who was uh, Prime Minister Harper's director of policy, saying, well, these allegations about Mr. Clement were uh, you know, circulating for a long time. Well, if that's the case, um, and people in the inner circle knew about this, why would they have appointed him to the National Security Committee to begin with? Mm. Uh, that has to be one of the most important positions that a party uh, gets to, to nominate, and you want that person to be above reproach completely. So I think there are certainly po possibly questions about Mr. Shear's judgment in that regard. Um, I think the benchmark for how political leaders deal with these things um, happened not because of Me Too a year ago, but really in the way that um, Justin Trudeau, when he was leader of the Liberals, ousted uh, Scott Andrews and Massimo Bichetti. Uh, then you realize that um, there is an absolute zero tolerance, that politics is always involved, and that uh, even though the Prime Minister now has not lived up to that benchmark that he set with people like Ken Hare or Hunter Tutu, for example, there are a lot of uh, questions and a lack of transparency around the ouster of Mr. Tutu, that um, you have to take these absolutely seriously and that usually you should be investigating and that there is um, people won't trust you by mm. default and yeah. so uh, transparency is definitely something that you want to instill and when it's not there whether it's a staffer like uh, Claude Eric Gagné in the Prime Minister's office yes. or it's Darshan Khan there is an expectation that you know people at the end of the day will get some sort of an answer as to why somebody was ousted and what happened. Um, I mean you, you've given lots of different names there of incidents that have happened and they're all sort of varying degrees. I wonder mm -hmm. Paul if it was the fact that there was some sort of uh, extortion attempt, at least according to Tony Clement, uh, that that led to this. Because otherwise, it's not clear to me w what it is. It, it's just a consensual relationship, or what? What exactly is what exactly is he being thrown out of caucus for? It, it's that he had opened himself up to uh, uh, um, essentially attacks against him that uh, compromised his freedom of choice. He was being blackmailed. Yes. And the astonishing thing is that something similar had happened, according to the report in the Toronto Star, uh, several weeks before the most recent uh, um, uh, incident, and that he should have he should he should already have learned the hard way that he was opening up to this sort of uh, of extortion. Uh, it's an extraordinary case. And Althea says that there's an absolute zero tolerance. I'm afraid that in some cases it looks like that's not quite true. It seems like Andrew Shear really hoped that he wasn't going to have to punish. Tony Clement too uh, harshly because Tony Clement has roots in the conservative movement that go back to the election of Mike Harris in 1995 in Ontario. He's never been one of the party's best performers, but he has been uh, well regarded um, and, and, and is essentially charitably regarded uh, by a lot of people who follow the party. And I think that slowed the leader's hand yeah. in, in meeting out appropriate punishment. And that's why this has been two or three days of awful, awful news for the Conservatives instead of just one. Yeah, and I guess that's what they probably should have avoided. Does it do any sort of lasting damage to the party, though, Andrew? Um, I don't think so. I mean, there, there have been cases on both sides of the aisle, in fact, including the case of the Prime Minister himself, who was credibly accused of groping someone and has never really bothered to properly deny it. So there's all kinds of shifting standards involved here. Um, but I think as long as, as it's contained to this, we don't have a rash of similar cases, and I don't see any reason why we would. Uh, I don't see it being a, a huge damage to the party. Okay, I want to switch gears if I can to talk a little bit about the midterms because inevitably that has some sort of impact here that we're all trying to to, to uh, get a sense of uh, in these early days. Here's a little bit of what Trudeau and the president said uh, just the day after. It's uh, something we look forward to working uh, with uh, the new Congress on a broad range of issues uh, as we have in the past. And a quick question on the USMCA. Now that it's been concluded, have you repaired your relationship with Prime Minister Trudeau? Yes, I have. We have a very good relationship. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Paul, in spite of all that, uh, I don't know if the relationship is so good, but I think it's functioning. Does, does what happened on Tuesday night change anything for Canada? Do we need to change our strategy and our approach? Is it good news, bad news? Where do you sit on that? Well, the, the new Democrat-controlled House of Representatives has to decide what they think about USMACA the trade agreement and there's um, there are essentially rumors that they're not thrilled with it and might impede its uh, implementation in itself that's not a horrible thing that just means we'd be stuck with old, the old NAFTA which uh, by most accounts 
the Canadian government and most Canadian businesses would have preferred anyway. <laughs> I mean, the only thing that could happen is that if in a confrontation with the Democrats in, in, in the House, uh, the president decides he's going to abrogate NAFTA, even in the absence of a new deal. But that would be a really bad day at the office um, and, and, and probably shouldn't be counted the, the likeliest outcome. Um, objectively, the president took a setback the other night. He lost the House of, uh, the House of Representatives. He lost several governorships. It was, a, it was a medium bad night for the president. But he lives in his own head, and he thinks he uh, scored a fabulous victory and is likely to be even less uh, impeded by other people's expectations of normal behavior mm. than before. We've seen that in his treatment of the White House press corps in the last 48 hours. Well, even getting rid of Just Sessions, too. I mean, we see that when oh, that. he's on defensive. <laughs> oh, that thing. <laughs> yeah, that thing. It, seem, it <laughs> seems as though this is how that he reacts to that. And I don't know if that's good news or bad news, uh, Althea, for Canada. I mean, possibly he just sort of forgets about us altogether because he's got enough going on. Uh, the president is not going to forget about us, Maka. This is definitely something he wants to wave around. Um, it's an interesting position for uh, the Trudeau Liberals and our embassy in uh, D.C. Uh, there are a number of first-time legislators uh, in the House of Representatives that uh, I'm sure the ambassador wants to get a better sense of where they stand on ASMACA, NAFTA, NAFTA 2.0. I think um, from what I've read and people I've spoken to, nobody expects a quick vote on this. But there is a risk that um, there is no vote before we head into a federal election next year. And then I think uh, this is where uh, NAFTA 2.0 could get inserted into the the election debate. Like, what would Andrew Scheer change about yeah. NAFTA 2.0? And so uh, there is a possibility that we keep talking about this for the months to come. How about you, Andrew? What, what do you think changes or doesn't change? Well, again, we don't know. It's going to depend on the makeup of the, the particular types of Democrats that were elected. On the whole, it looks like there were, there were more moderates than radicals elected for the Democrats. Um, if we were negotiating from scratch, there might be worrisome that, that, that they're traditional protectionist things, but it's, it's, it's changing. You know, you look at mm -hmm. the public opinion polls now, Republicans, because Donald Trump's against free trade, have shifted en masse against free trade, and Democrats have kind of shifted en masse against Republicans. Mm -hmm. So there's actually some uh, free trade sentiment among Democrats and Democratic voters these days. I think what you will probably see is it'll get caught up in, in the general horse trading and log rolling that goes on in Congress all the time. And there will be conditions attached and demands attached and, um, you know, changes that will be asked for. And that will be interesting to see exactly how the administration responds to that. Do they cut a deal with them? Do they say, no, we've, we've got to deal with the Canadians, we can't change it? Um, so it, it adds uncertainty. It means we'll probably have to go back to lobbying the, the various Congress members uh, the way we were doing before. Uh, so it will continue that, that uncertainty. But uh, other than that, I guess we're just going to have to wait and see. Uh, I'll end with you, Paul, on, on that issue. Do you think it delays the implementation of NAFTA for the reasons that Andrew put out there, that, that just it, things are just going to be harder to get them finalized? Well, and, uh, like until it's implemented, until, it's, it's, until it passes a vote in the Congress and it's implemented, it's sitting around and uh, idle hands are the devil, devil's playground. Somebody might be tempted to uh, oppose a contested amendment, just as we saw in several European legislatures, uh, with with CETA. the CETA yeah, trade, yeah. Trade, trade agreement. And so, uh, look, a, a, a quick ratification would be better. But I, well, I, I was about to say I don't see any problems arising, but it's been a lousy <laughs> year for people to make that kind of prediction, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Particularly with anything to do down there. <laughs> George Schultz, the former Treasury Secretary and Secretary of State, said, nothing is ever settled in this town, meaning Washington. So everything is always in play, even when you think it's been, it's been uh, dealt with. So that's words to live by. All right, we'll leave it there. Thanks, everybody. Before we go, be sure you subscribe to the Ad Issue podcast. We've got extra content there. And this week, we're talking about politicians versus the press. We alluded to it in the main panel, but we'll dig into this latest clash of Trumps with reporters. Look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. And if the at issue panel leaves you hungry for a little more conversation, earlier tonight the National hosted a special event in Toronto. The Minister of Foreign Affairs, Christian Freeland, joined Rosie, Adrian, and Keith Bogue, along with journalists from the Washington Post. They answered questions and dug a little deeper into the state of Canada-U.S. relations. Here's a taste. Is there evidence, though, that Canadians can trust Donald Trump? You know, I think that is really a question for the president. 
and it is a oh, question. No, 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 no. That, that's a question for you too. Given, given the no, way he. No, no. Given I, the way, I'm not, given, I think I think it's a question for Americans. No, given, they're, they're, Americans are the ones who elect him, not us. Given the our way job, he has behaved. Job, Rosie, given the way he has behaved, though, you have to take him at his word when he says, "Yeah, we're going to go ahead and sign this." There's no evidence that this is a person that keeps his promises. Um, I don't think. Am I wrong? I wouldn't disagree with that. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> So then wh why should Canadians feel confident that you guys are okay trusting him? Well, or do you've, you not? You, I was going to say, you've put a bunch of different words in my mouth, none of which I will sign up to. <laughs> Don't you want to see more of that conversation? Well, you can tomorrow on CBC News Network at 8 Eastern. You can also see part of it tomorrow here on The National. And still ahead tonight on The National, Transport Canada says the system that allows airlines to report their own safety issues is better than the old system of random spot checks by inspectors. But CBC News has documents suggesting there's more to the story than that. It seems to me it's a very serious situation which is being played down. When we last left out, mm -hmm. James found the incriminating cell phone bill. Yes. But then Hillary confronted him with his affair with her twin. I cannot get enough of this relationship. No, it's Ugh. good. Ugh. OK. Here we go. Oh. Mm. Oh. Oh. God. You're bullshit all over the place. There's a room full of bullshit right now, Hillary. I want a divorce. Oh. Plot twist. Oh. God, I love it when they drink. A new season of Baroness Von Sketch Show. Tuesdays at 9 on CBC. It's the final season of Mr. D. Final call for Tokyo. New life, new country, fresh start. Do you know any schools around here looking to hire a teacher? Mr. D. Double episode. Wednesday at 9 on CBC. So scared. A terrifying escape in Northern California today. Tens of thousands of people have been evacuated as a fierce wildfire spread quickly. A state of emergency was declared, and so far, around a thousand structures have been destroyed, including hundreds of homes and a hospital. Two firefighters and a number of other people have been injured. There have been protests across the United States tonight to show support for special counsel Robert Mueller. It comes after Donald Trump fired Attorney General Jeff Sessions yesterday. Many worry that his replacement could slow down or even freeze the Russia investigation. The Christmas season is approaching and we know that's when uh, Canadians use Canada Post more than uh, at any other time. Of course, management and the union both know this. Uh, but uh, if we don't see a significant uh, resolution uh, shortly, uh, all options will be on the table uh, for resolving this. The Prime Minister is showing signs of losing patience with uh, the Canada Post dispute and apparently contemplating some sort of government action. For nearly three weeks, rotating strikes have shut down operations in communities across the country. And after these protests, she has been sent back. Convicted killer Terry Lynn McClintock now in an Edmonton prison after serving time at an Indigenous healing lodge. In 2010, she was sentenced to life in prison for the murder of eight-year-old Tori Stafford. Her transfer to the lodge sparked public outrage and political debate. There are new questions tonight about air safety in this country, tracing back to documents that have come to light around a prominent Canadian airline, Air Transat. The concerns go back to 2015, and we'll explain what they mean today. But first, it's helpful to understand how air safety regulations have changed in this country. About 10 years ago, Transport Canada moved towards an approach called Safety Management Systems, or SMS. The basic idea was to have airlines come up with their own protocols to identify risks and then fix them. The hope was that SMS would be proactive, an efficient way to identify and solve problems before they became big problems. But actual inspections by Transport Canada quickly tapered off. And instead, now it focuses more on the SMS plans, making sure airlines are looking for the right things. But those plans only work when the airlines actually document potential problems and report them to Transport Canada where required. 
And that's one of the ways Air Transat fell short back in 2015, something as CBC's Katie Nicholson shows us some industry watchers find troubling today. You're already on vacation. It specializes in exotic getaways, designed to give Canadians some rest and relaxation. Air Transat, vacation is calling. What travelers might find not so soothing the results of this 2015 Transport Canada review of the airline's operations, obtained through an access to information request. It found problems with the airline's safety, maintenance and training procedures. In all, inspectors made 22 findings, 14 of them considered major. Among those, 41 of 42 contract maintenance workers in Toronto and Montreal did not meet any of the approved training requirements. Routine checks on 737s were missed because planes were on four different maintenance schedules. And there were reporting problems. When corroded hinge pins were discovered on a rudder, that problem should have been passed on to Transport Canada. But inspectors discovered it wasn't. It, it reads bad, frankly. The Canadian Federal Pilots Association says it's surprised Transport Canada didn't suspend the airline. The response isn't what I would expect it to be, which may be more along the lines of you know, a notice of suspension with a time limit to, you know, to push the air operator to fix the issues. So that's where I, I have a hard time. Either they are major findings or they aren't. Air Transat says the required corrections were made swiftly and none of those findings ever compromised the safety of our airline operations. Well, it flies in the face of the results of the investigation. Virgil Moshansky presided over the judicial inquiry into the 1989 Air Ontario crash that killed 24 people near Dryden. He recommended Transport Canada bring in SMS or safety management systems, but that was supposed to be in addition to regular on-site Transport Canada inspections, not instead of them. And that has gone by the boards. There are insufficient inspectors to conduct hands-on investigations. To Mashansky, the Air Transat report signals something needs to change. I think that we are in a position where we need another commission of inquiry into the state of aviation safety in Canada, as we did following the Dryden crash. We asked Transportation Minister Mark Garneau whether he thought another inquiry was necessary. He didn't answer the question, but his office says Canada's air safety record demonstrates that the current approach to safety is working. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Winnipeg. Just ahead on the National, our moment of the day, the city of Calgary cracks open a time capsule that's almost as old as the province of Alberta. You know, this is not buried treasure. There's not jewels in here, I don't think. <laughs> uh, there's no Michigan J Frog coming out either. But these are records of people. These are records of the people who dreamt big. It's the show that had the nation talking about what being smart really means. Oh my gosh! Challenging competitors in six distinctive categories. Now, Canada's smartest person is back with one big little change. Kids! Get ready for Survival of the Smartest with Paul Sun Hyung Lee from Kim's Convenience, Canada's Smartest Person Junior. New series begins November 14th on CBC. It's the final season of Mr. D. Final call for Tokyo. New life, new country, fresh start. Do you know any schools around here looking to hire a teacher? Mr. D. Double episode, Wednesday at 9 on CBC. Do you ever solve cases the coppers can't? It's my specialty. An all new Frankie Drake Mysteries, Monday on CBC. For 110 years, this little copper box has been tucked away in an alcove under the cornerstone of Calgary's old city hall. It is a time capsule placed there September 15, 1908, when the building was being built. But due to age and deteriorating sandstone, the landmark is undergoing an extensive renovation. And today the capsule was retrieved and opened for the first time. And that is our moment of the day. It was very exciting to see the lid come off it today. I was very nervous that it wouldn't 
come off easily. Well, you can have a look at the top of the box, but we can't actually go inside the box because the items are too fragile. You know, this is not buried treasure. There's not jewels in here, I don't think. <laughs> uh, there's no Michigan J Frog coming out either. But these are records of people. These are records of the people who dreamt big, who wanted future generations to benefit from their investment and from their work. We're allergic to small dreams here. And building this building was another great example of that. And I am so excited to see the historical record of that. I love time capsules, Andrew, <laughs> but you know, Mayor Nancy talked about no valuables in there. It's true, there's some coins, the most, uh, the highest denomination coin, just 25 cents. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I, I like time capsules too. I, what I find really interesting is to read the newspapers that they put in there. And indeed, they, they put a few newspapers because it's always fun to see, you know, what they thought was important at the time, the issues at play, what was contentious at the time, what wasn't contentious. It's, it's always, you never know. There's always a disconnect, right, between then and now. I, I love old newspapers, uh, but that's if these papers are still intact, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, you mentioned the deterioration uh, of the building itself. That very same problem is, is what has, has evidently caused some damage to the contents of that, of that time capsule. So hopefully they, they managed to restore that, too. And what about the people in 2018 who want to put together a time capsule for, say, 2118? I guess it would be, <laughs> what, an iPhone? They just need to make sure they put in a charger as well. <laughs> there you go. Good idea. <laughs> that is The National for Thursday, November the 8th. Good night. Good night.